Hello everyone, it's Chris Holland here. I'm sitting with this lovely man here, Robin Harford. I've been very lucky to know him for many years. In fact, we bumped into each other in a bookshop in Bath in the uh, in 1990s. And then uh, we sort of re-met each other down here in Devon again in the early 2000s. And uh, as some of you may know already, Robin is, well, he's quite well known in the foraging world. And um, yeah, he knows a lot about plants and people. And that's why I've come to speak, speak to him today. Um, I even heard that uh, Country File have, have him listed at one as Britain's top forager. So um, I would recommend him too, because I love the stories that he tells about plants and people. And that's why I've come to talk to him today. And so, Robin, <laughs> I know that... Uh, He's nervous. Yeah, I am nervous. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to plants, you know so much, not just about the details of um, you know, what's in them, but there's loads of history and stuff like that. But when did you actually start getting into the stories of plants? I have absolutely no idea, actually. There was, it was, one, it was never a conscious decision to become a teacher, which I still don't see myself as. I just flap my lips about plants to anyone who's prepared to hear. Um, but I've always very much had an interest in the world at large. I'm naturally quite anarchic, so the idea of being a leader or yeah. a teacher just really doesn't compute. But <laughs> hey, I find myself in this situation, don't I? Yeah. The ecosystem often has a bigger agenda for us than we even realise. That's one truism that I'm absolutely sold on. So plants and people. Um, ethnobotanical researcher, if I'm going to be bagged and tagged, and mm -hmm. foraging is something that I do rather than it being a profession. Um, I don't supply restaurants, I do it personally for myself and what I love or started realising, okay we need to back step here, so okay. I was in digital marketing until 2004, broke down, for those of you that don't know, became a really good drug addict and alcoholic and in order to get well started walking my dog down the green lanes around where I lived in Devon. Um, and didn't know what this greenness was and I grew up in the countryside I loved nature it was my sanctuary to get away from horrible adults who were not very kind yeah um, and I would take a plant out and go to the library and look it up and it would be predominantly medicinal you know 80% of the plants were medicinal but being a bit of a foodie um, I like the medicine side, that was fascinating, but the food was what I focused on, and yeah. I started realizing that some of the plants had been food as well. So that's what I started exploring, and I started getting the usual books out, Food for Free, um, by Richard Maybe, Wild Food, Roger Phillips, the usual kind of mm. go-to books that everyone knows about. Uh, and then I just started exploring more, and the stories kind of came about themselves. I'm not a storyteller either, that's the other thing. <laughs> People Rubbish. keep telling me I'm a storyteller. I don't tell fantasy fiction stories, but I do collate. The way my brain works is it kind of explores a universe around a subject. So you might take ground ivy, and suddenly I'm exploring medieval history. I'm exploring social history, enclosures, how, what was the influence on, on the people then, and mm -hmm. there by default, what was the influence of our connection to plants. And, yeah, the, just... I'm a vacuum for data. Mm. And you sort of spew it out in such a lovely way as well. In that it's, you tie all these different bits and bobs together from all over the place because you're so, so widely read. It's like you've gone into this world of edible plants and just consumed as much as you can information about it, the history and the, the, the chemistry and, and, and everything. And you know, going on a walk with you, I, I, you know, what I find funny is that in a way that we re-met partly through foraging courses and and you can you came well you along. took me out i mean <laughs> let's let's get let's get the story down in black and white so to speak yeah but when i wanted to learn about wild food plants you were the first person to take me out and so that was the genesis yeah i suppose so but you were already interested yeah and um so but i i just i love the way that you've drawn in so much more information and and now 
Now you've you've published like fifty notebooks on plants, yeah. and you you've been self publishing for for you know, decades, pretty much since nineteen ninety five. Yeah, yeah. I, not on plants back then, on privacy and counter surveillance. <laughs> nice little grey area there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in a way, your anarchic personality has kind of lends itself well to this kind of common sense world of plants and it's like yeah. this is the stuff that people should be knowing about so and what i love about it is that you you share it so widely and uh, i think that's what drags people onto your course or not not you don't get dragged they just get impelled to come they do i mean it's a bit of a it's a it, it it's funny because they come people come on my courses thinking that we're going to talk food and I'm into language a lot. I'm very deliberate about the kinds of words I choose. Sometimes I'm deliberately challenging and provocative um, because I talk about to meet plants, we have to break out of our monoculture thinking, the dominant culture thinking, which is, you know, if you take the word monoculture, that's normally a field that's a square with one plant. You know, there's no diversity. And and so they come thinking oh, I'm, they're just going to have a talking head with facts and figures and mm. they do get that to a point but only once I've made them work and I do make people work I mean it's about empowering people to stop looking at the bloody authorities and the gurus and the gods who set themselves up as some expert and realise that you know we exist because of plants we've fed since we were weaned from breast or bottle we have textures and flavors within us you don't need me to tell you how to cook with it even though i've got a recipe site yeah but you know even still people say oh can i use one teaspoon of honey as opposed to two it's like for god's sake just <laughs> fucking take responsibility and yeah. empower yourself and trust trust your response to the ecosystem trust your response to a plant when you crush it and you smell it you know that's where that's the work for mm. me is the re-empowering of people with their embedded traditional knowledge that even though they don't think they've got it they have got it yeah because we've all eaten we eat every day unless we're sick or we're on on you know still in the womb and even then we're still we're eating what the mother's eating yeah yeah so yeah. it's a it's a it's a multifaceted way of introducing people to plants but the food thing is just the beginning i mean take the word food what does that mean are, are we talking just this or are we talking a far deeper level of being fed mm. on and I don't use quasi spiritual words but a feeding that's in the core of our being that nourishment we get when we go out on a crazy mad grey dark windy wet day that that feeling we come back with even if we haven't eaten yeah. feeding and eating are different things yeah. um, we have been fed deeply have, yeah. in our core and to me if I can just introduce people to that aspect of what foraging for me is all about which is restoring vital connection uh -huh. that's it mm. yeah um, and that that restoration you don't have to go to well this is where I'm a bit more kind of out there I suppose I'm an outlier in this in this discussion that you don't need to be in wilderness you don't need to be in countryside you can do it in your city park 80 percent of us live in the city in a city um and and for me it's vital that the stories are told in a way if they are indeed stories um in a way that will be relevant to the single parent in the most economically deprived part of britain period if i can't do that i haven't done my job mm. so that's not about watering everything down and becoming mediocre it's about making the information and the data accessible to everybody and therefore language is really 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 important to do that yeah and i often talk about the wisdom of the gutter you know you'll find more wisdom on the street in the gutter than you will at the top of a mountain in a temple people are wise yeah we're all wise and we forget we go looking for that wisdom in someone else or yeah yeah anyway i think I've, you've made my point and the other point is about the word gather mm -hmm. oh we're going gathering are we okay yeah we are going gathering so there's a communal aspect there but we're gathering together we're gathering plants yeah. we gather together to celebrate to break bread together 
to recognize our commonality with each other yeah so words mm. are good words yeah. are really good I suppose this is about storytelling so they it are is. important aren't they uh, yeah but they're Vital. not stories you see you're a storyteller and I don't <laughs> I don't I just uh. don't don't put myself into that same space because I don't spin folk tales or stuff like that yeah well there's there's so many different layers to storytelling um, everyone's got a story to tell and it may be a personal story it might be a story about a thing or a plant or you know, how this microphone came to be here just in front of us um, or it could be you know the history of something and um, everyone tells that in a different way humans are you know oral creatures and so it, it's something that's innate in any of us and I think some, if you find a sort of scene that you're happy to talk about then that's when you can sort of tap into something that's kind of beyond you like there's this storyteller or there's this information behind us that will come out through this mouth another mouth will say it in a different way so you know I too don't see myself as um, a certain kind of storyteller like one who can tell epic tales for a whole night long yeah you know my kind of stories are like 10 15 minutes long so there's lots of different different ways of telling a story but is a um, story almost also trying to transmit or communicate a moral principle or an insight or is it just a story i mean wow. what what yeah, if, if you're asking are we me, are we about making change happen if we're storytellers mm. are we about making change happen in the world or are we just there to tickle someone's mm. well I don't know heart for a moment yeah I think that's I like that tickle someone's heart for a moment and you know, somebody said to me many years ago that you know stories are a little bit like rose petals or you know little bits of fruit and sometimes they will just drop on the wayside and and so nobody pick them up or maybe somebody will come along and pick them and you know get nourishment or be fed by the story um, on some deep level and you know each story will be listened to at a different level by each different person like this weekend I was was asked to do a little bit of storytelling so I chose a particular story which you know often I will tell to sort of eight to 12 year olds because it's and it's a story about the seasons it's about letting go it's about um, sharing your gifts and realizing what your gifts are and being sort of proud of them and um, and the kind of regenerative cycle of the year but you know an 8 or 12 year old wouldn't get that yeah. on that level of the story underneath it the, and then underneath that again there's different layers to it so yeah I think stories land in different ways like different seeds will need different soils to land in yeah, um, and to be fertile in that way yeah you see my yeah. granddaughter who's who's coming into being eight in a month she's a story t she's what i call a storyteller because she spins stories about wild witches and yeah. berries and flowers and makes potions and yeah so it's more i suppose to me in my my kind of understanding of stories is that they're more imaginary they come f they're more ima Im imagination mm -hmm. but they're yeah but yeah there's yeah anyway it's low, like just as many different types of plants like you say yeah different types of stories yeah I would say yeah one of the things I wanted to um, get your thoughts on is that at the moment with climate change and um, uh, as our biomes are changing as well and plants are beginning to grow in different places and with the way that humans have moved around we've kind of shuffled in a way the natural shuffled the deck in terms of the plants and where they've been growing naturally and some of them are sort of popping up here and there and everywhere where they haven't been growing for hundreds or thousands of or hundreds even, of thousands even of grown yeah even ever grown yeah um and so it's like um i can't even cheeky, invas aren't they? invasive species is one of the words that people use and oh those bloody immigrants you mean well like, exactly, and people yeah. use that language yeah, the daily mail headlines what on the plants yeah absolutely immigrant not bloody immigrants but immigrant plants uh -huh. yeah 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 i mean this right-wing fascist construct is percolates through so many different areas that would project it onto a plant yeah something of the other oh mm. can't have the other here it's not native so what do you not think british about that, what do i think about it i yeah. bloody love invasive species <laughs> um people Excellent. people challenge me off on my walks but uh, the, especially when i start talking about um, 
new arrivals like Himalayan balsam and mm -hmm. Japanese knotweed mm. um, as they go but it crowds out all the native plants and it's like okay let's just stop right here what on earth do you mean by native what do you mean by native um, what do you mean by indigenous plants at the end of the last ice age from my understanding and someone may completely blow this out of the yeah. water but from my understanding there were 150 so-called indigenous plants well stace brought out his new um flora his, his new wildflower flora so i found out the publishers and they went there's 5,000. so we had 150 of our so-called indigenous native mm -hmm. species and we now got 5,000. Mm. well everything yeah. is a blow-in everything is an immigrant every or a migrant has come here somehow mm. so what do i think of native of in, invasive species um i really like them i spotted himalayan balsam a long time over a decade ago and started pondering why are you here mm. because my plant teacher mentor frank cook that chris introduced me to always said if there's a plant growing around humans in profusion you need to be paying attention to mm. it and you need to be figuring out what is the relationship that's going on between the plant and the human and the human and the plant. And so we ponder this. And I spoke to a lot of kind of um, far more um, academically focused ecologists, etc. And the phrase that kept coming out is second guessing climate change. It's like, what? what do you... Blimey, that's interesting. Okay. Mm. So this plant comes in Himalayan balsam and, and I'm researching it and the seeds are delicious. They taste like walnuts and mm. in India and in the Himalayas they use a, they extract an oil from it and you know there's, there's no other bit of the plant you could, that the, the plant you can eat in the ethnobotanical record that I've found. Again, someone may be able to qualify that, but I certainly haven't found any other part of it, which is important because it's seriously high in calcium oxalates and you don't want to be eating the rest of it. I'm just making health yes. and safety, the, the health or safety. elf in safety as we call yes. it. Um, and, yeah. and so why, why is this plant here? And mm. then slowly the kind of the, the change in understanding of ecology and conservation as well and this idea that we need to get rid of the foreigner, get them out we want only British plants was indicative to a, a, an imperialist, colonialist conservation culture that is still going on, especially mm. with people like WWF, and I hope you're listening here, genocidal maniacs. Um, that's my latest beef. Listen to St read Stephen Corey, who's the CEO of Survival International, if you really want to know what's going on with these conservation NGOs, because it's a dark, dark story. Anyway, mm. that aside, I hope you keep that bit in, because yeah, people yeah. need, do need to know this. Um, was what 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 what's this plant doing? What's what's its function? So Stephen Harrod Booner, who wrote the the, the great plantsman and plant walker, yeah. you know, he talks about this. Everything has an ecological function. So what's the ecological function of Himalayan balsam in the British Isles? Yeah, now in this time now yeah. and slowly, what's come out is Fred Pierce in his book The New Wild. That suddenly, you know, this man who's an um, ecological journalist investigative journalist hated invasive species uh -huh. <clears throat> for years and then wrote this book the new world which completely flipped the flipped his brain because oh. he, and he goes on hard data yeah? this isn't like plant spirit medicine stuff this is hard data what's the data the science saying and he's completely reversed his belief system in that actually invasive species are here for a, a reason and something like himalayan balsam only occurs where humans have disturbed the soil so we've been pointing at the plant going you you bad plant and we got three <laughs> fingers pointing at us yeah. and not realizing that we possibly could be the reason mm. and that what this plant is doing is actually healing soil right cleaning soil up mm. and it comes from an interesting climate so i've got a friend pete yo who runs yeah. future flora and he's massively geeking out on invasive species and studying them and he's he's made a really interesting correlation between those plants that are defined as invasive and the climates that they've come from so he reckoned and it is purely hypothesis this so we're just observing it but it's an interesting one that it, it kind of is correlating with my work and many other people's work that these plants are coming from cultures whose climate, the, U, the UK climate, is possibly expected to be in the next 10 to 20 years. Mm, so yeah. this idea that somehow 
we got to go back to the native. It's like the rewilders, and I'm not saying all rewilders do this, but there's a big element of them. And Pete and I actually um, did an interview on why the bulls and bashers might be wrong. And we'd received an, an email from one of the rewilding organisations when we, when Pete had asked them about, well, what are you doing about invasives? And their policy was genocide. Get rid of them. <laughs> no, no, they're not native. No, no, it's not yeah, back it's in this pristine out. wilderness. You know, with the courtesy of that racist John Muir. Ooh, mm. I'm being controversial, aren't I? Mm. But I'm basically spitting out at what I believe. Um, John Muir, you know, who, who took these beautiful images of pristine wilderness. And it's even written in one of his diaries, if you go and read it, that he had to wait until those foul, stinking beasts had got out of the frame. Yeah, and when I say that to people, people go, oh, he means buffaloes. It's like, no, he meant Native Americans. Nice guy. And so we have this belief, this world view in, our, in the ecology, the conservation, the sustainability movement that somehow we need pristine wilderness and sorry ch chaps and chapettes, yeah. nature's on a continuum yeah. and we're shopping and the rest of the ecosystem is adapting. So, yeah, like yeah. Don't over shopping, demonize. Bit, <laughs> we are over shopping, <laughs> darling, yes. <laughs> Yes, how many pairs of shoes and trousers do you need? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a curious old world at the moment. Mm, um, it I is. love invasive species, and some people have observed that when they've cleaned up the soil, they actually die back, something like Himalayan mm. balsam. And well, the that's what I've been noticing recently as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go. Yeah. See? Yeah, and the, and the bees love them. Yeah, they so do. It's really important to have some late forage for them, and yeah. there's not much else around. And cattle love them. Yeah, do they? Munch it, oh, munch and they're away. big carbon sink mm. apparently I Lovely. think anyway I'm moving off something I don't actually know about yeah okay well let's stick to things that we do know about or think we know about anyway um, so <laughs> <laughs> think being the operative word. word yeah uh, the, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about is that um, in terms of being I know you don't call yourself a storyteller but the power to tell a story yeah when it really is tripping off your tongue then um, what you know what kind of tips might you give to a, a budding storyteller or an outdoor educator or a parent who's you know, would like to feel a bit more confident about speaking up about something you know a story of something what could you what tip could you give them imbue the tale with your own experience don't invalidate your experience however simple it might be it might just be picking a, a bramble fruit blackberry and, and making jam with it one day but there's you know what did I, I love Boone's words in, in his book in Soling Language he says words and language are meant to imbue a feeling sense otherwise they stay up in the head yeah and that doesn't serve anybody um, and, and so if, you, if you're talking bramble to children or adults or angels, whoever, um, pull in your own experience of it, not from a fact base, this is where it gets more poetic, I mm. suppose, but from that feeling sense, you know, what, what did it feel like, that first fruit of the summer as you bit into it and, and reveled in it and just could feel it? filling your bones you know what mm. so personal I pull a lot of my own personal story life story and interweave it with plants um, great I think yeah put you in it yeah put you in it because it's real it's authentic it's it it gives quality and depth to the story it's not you're not dissociated from oh this is bramble and mm. did you know you can make tea with the leaf if you ferment it and you know that's nice that's great but bring it in and yeah. fold it into your own dream your own experience and and then that becomes colored and unique yeah and so we can all take the same facts of a plant because if we're trying to teach people how to use a pl plant in the in a specific way but we we fill it up with ourselves and, and that's I think really vital because mm. and don't try and be a bloody expert God's sake forget the scripts of, of being being an authority I mean I'm an old punk so that's why I bang on about it because we've all become you know it you, you pull people in pull pull them into the to the plant don't pick a plant and hand it to them encourage self-responsibility encourage empowerment encourage personal engagement and don't give them any of the facts initially 
call the group out, ask them what are they getting, what's the experience, what mm. does it smell like, what does it remind them of, what does it taste like to them? Because that's where the connection starts, isn't it? That is yeah. the point. And that's what we want. Baseline. And yeah. if, if that's all that they go away with, you've set them off on a life journey that many of them will never return from. <laughs> the world will grab their heart yeah <laughs> the plants will get them yeah they're bloody the right they will get in there oh great um, and another thing is that what well two more things one is um, plant for this time of year it's the end of the year it's October end of October beginning of November today um, and um so traditionally this was a sort of Beltane festival time when the spirit of the land was kind of going back into the land. Um, is a it plant Beltane or Samhain? Samhain, sorry, Beltane's in, in May. I'm just uh, being nervous on on camera. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so Samhain and um, spirit of the land going into the ground, but there's still a few plants around. Yeah, there are. So one is like, what are you, plant are you excited about at the moment, if you could choose one? And also tell people how they can get in contact with you and you know what things have you published recently that you'd like people to know about yeah I got asked this question yesterday do I have a favourite plant now I always find it a really difficult question to mm. answer but mm -hmm. I suppose if I'm kind of like you know who's hanging out in the corner a bit like you know he's got a roll up and a pint and a flat cap and they're just over there going oi Rob pay attention I'm over here yeah gotta be ground ivy uh-huh yeah you mentioned ground ivy yeah earlier. it's just i'm a smelly person i just yeah. like smelly plants i'm very um yeah i'm very yeah. olfactory through my nose I, I i identify plants through their smell i encourage you to do that um ev just as every human has a unique smell i believe mm. i have no evidence for this but i believe every plant has a unique smell yeah. um, and it's only by picking crushing and smelling them and and only if they're edible children do you eat them um but it's the smell mm. i learned of a tribe in africa actually this year in, in one of the anthropological papers that their vocabulary is something like 40 50 times greater for describing the sense of smell than it is color wow yeah which is pretty bonkers because in the West we got this thing that you know we came up off the off all fours, and when we stood up, eyes were the thing. That's the medium that we learn yeah. the world through. And honest, I've I've done a bit of travelling into forests with indigenous cultures, and it's like, nah, it's bollocks. They're the still eyes really dominant. Into they're, the smell. They're, they're, yeah. like, they're all the senses, and yeah. smell is really, really crucial. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So ground ivy, I love because it's really pongy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one it of the first herbs honks. I got into as well. Love it. Love I don't it. know what it is about it, but I go with that. I want to make a drink with it. So, you know, yeah. past life, can't drink alcohol as a result. So um, in spring, I've, it's in the diary, go make a syrup, a cordial with it, because I think it will be quite cool. Um, and it's got such a history. It has, hasn't it? I mean, it's like... Ale it, hoof. And ale hoof. Pre group, I mean, do you want the story? Go on, if you yeah, want to share a right. bit. How long have we got? <laughs> Blimey, I don't know. Let's make it short. Yeah. Um, so, you know, pre before hops came into our drinking culture, which was around the 1600s, I think, uh, prior to that, we clarified and add bitterness to our hedgerow plants, our ales. Uh, they were known as Groot ales, G R U I T. Groot. Groot. And ale hoof, ground ivy. Glaucoma hedera, whatever, yep. um, was put into the brew. So we had this time of, of in our culture where, because it was medieval times, you know, men and women wore bright colours, rings on fingers, bells on toes, we just danced around. Um, you know, 200 festival and feast days in a year out of 365 days. That's party central, man. <laughs> Merry England. Yeah, M-E-R-R-I-E -R -R -E. yeah. that is like we were good. the bell would only sound once for prayer at 6pm or midday you know I mean time was it was like not really part of our you know clock ticking sorry of 2 30 seconds late for work kind of did not really mm. it was not on the cards yeah. yeah it was a different way pre time um, then in a way pre, pre clock as well it was pre clock in the, yeah. in the countryside yeah and so we drank these ales for our celebrations and they were quite weak I would assume mm. And then you kind of get the Puritans coming in with their 
with their hops, you know, and it's it's like anti-sex mm. brewers drew. That's where it comes from. It's hops. It's soporific. Yeah. It it keeps the peasants and the plebs at bay because we were quite a rebellious lot. We, you know, we kept our masters in check back then. Well, now we go on the streets and beg them to make change. Now we made them make change. Um, controversial again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and and so it dampened our, our our fire, and we could get a skinful and turn up the next day. You know, to mm. work, mm. and then you, we were made. We wore black. We took off our colours, took off our bells. They banned singing and song. The Bursley banned Christmas. The Puritans, and we wore black and became shameful of our bodies and shameful of our minds. And then we jumped forwards to when black Indian tea came into this culture, which was really expensive. So the mm. aristocracy would get their servants to go and buy the tea. They'd make the tea. They'd strain the tea out. Servants would take the tea leaves back to the tea merchant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Round two, second-hand tea. Sell it to the people who, did, who weren't aristocrats and didn't have servants, but were definitely trying to aspire to that level. Yeah. They'd have to make their own blooming tea. They'd have to strain their own tea, and they'd have to hobble back down to the tea merchant to sell the tea back to him. Third-hand tea. Now, working-class people ain't thick, right? And the tea merchant knew that. He knew that if he tried to sell third-hand wood tea to the masses yeah. he might have a bit of a problem so, might not have a shop yeah. at the end a little bit of rumpus going on <laughs> and so he in, was ingenious and he gathered ground ivy leaves and he dried them and he mixed it in with the tea and it was sold as gill tea or gilly tea uh -huh. so which is really refreshing I mean ground ivy leaf as a tea is is really yeah, rehydrating good, you can it? just feel it soaking in through your body mm. um, and then jump forward to the modern day yeah well, where do we work with this? We've got all the Michelin, lovely Michelin chefs and all that. And, and I met a, a chef in Dorset and he was bigging up ground ivy leaf one day and I just spat it out. I said, well, what do you use that? And he went, steak and ale pie. Ah, so from the middle ages, we grew ales, we got yeah. to the black India tea, to using it with steak and ale pie because there is that inference. And it is, it's like you could make wild bouquet garnies with it, you know, mixed mm. herbs, just dried. And yeah, and you did something with a load of kids, didn't you? Tempering it like Tempering. a thousand leaves, and which one won? Uh, ground ivy and Nothing. nettles were the, uh, the were the favourites. Yeah, 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 there you go. Yeah. So you're going to have to look for it, right? Mm. Get yeah, multiple get books and, and, and look around. yeah, in the woods yeah. somewhere, and just smell the woods. Yeah, forget standing back. Get in and crush and mm. smell everything. Because all the smells are much lower down, aren't they? Totally. They don't really get up to here, so it's. Yeah. It's good to get on your hands and knees and have a sniff around. It is. <laughs> get an eyeglass. Here's a little fun thing you can do yeah. with the kids and everybody else. Get a little eyeglass, a loop, botanical loop, and spend 45 minutes going across a woodland floor just using oh, the eyeglass. Yeah. And you'll be amazed how many ticks there are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that's another thing. We won't go into that one at the moment. No. Yes. But that one, that again, that okay. kind of reframes your brain. Yeah. To, to be absorbed and consumed by wildness that mm. is the dandelion cracking through the pavement as you walk down London you know yeah ain't gonna stop the greenness yeah it's coming back I love that graffiti artist who, um, I can't remember her name who yeah. draws the plants wild plants and things yeah so um, tell us about your notebooks and you know the stuff that people can can get off you what's happening um, so I have a information site called eat weeds .co.uk e a t w e d s .co.uk and you'll find everything that I do find my courses there find my notebooks there there's a ton of free content there if you basically haven't got a bean to rub together but please support the independent creative artist because we also have bills to pay and I don't do funding and I don't beg corporations for cash it's all self generated yeah um, awesome and yeah tons and tons of recipes but like I say you know trust your senses use the recipes just as a springboard if you really can't just pause crush smell or nibble and then just see what it reminds you of and go with that inspiration because I didn't when I first started and now it's about 85% hit rate trust yourself as the old crass the anarcho punk band said be your own authority <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Remember that first time I gave you a uh, pine, a piece of pine, no, it wasn't pine cone, it was a uh, pine cone bud. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the coastal I've path. I've forgotten about that. And, you know, getting into your senses. And I just remember you sort of going, 
Like, what? What is this? I got completely walloped. Hmm. Actually, I don't do plant spirit medicine, but if I did, then this that thing was a moment, was smacked it? me. Big style. <laughs> I literally went over. Yeah. It was such a, a, it was like a charge coming in. It, I, I, hmm. I hadn't remember, I'd forgotten remember all that. that. But I remember yeah. it now, very yeah. visibly. Yeah. yeah, that's like, by me. Hey, anyway. I hope you have some great experience out, experiences out there with plants and um, uh, thank you so much for your time this morning in this Pleasure place sir. a little bit down the River X. We've had the mower, we've had the robin, blackbirds and all kinds of stuff. The but train, the plane. Yeah. I haven't had an automobile. No, not yet. But we are on the edge of a city, yeah. so that's okay. Which is, edges are good. Edges are good for Edges plants. are good. Yeah. Very much. Anyway. Till the next time. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Cheers, mate. Awesome.